These are two meat rabbits that we got um, that we're raising right now during winter time in the garden because we have so much clover and grass growing here that it's a bit hard to keep up with it in the winter. These two were the ideal solution because they graze everything down um, and also fertilize it at the same time when we can even collect the fertilizer and put it straight onto our cabbage and carrot beds that we have here. The setup is pretty simple. Um, overnight they stay in a cage in the greenhouse where we can collect their poop as well. Um, I don't particularly like them. We do put some cardboard in so they don't have to sit on the bars of the cage all the time. And then during the day when it's not absolutely pouring, they're out here in their little rabbit tractor. Um, this is a bit of a prototype I've built out of the old hutch. Um, a year ago we had rabbits as well. Unfortunately they died um, from a viral disease and um, that we couldn't vaccinate against. So this is our second try with rabbits so far. Like knock on wood, no viral disease, no hemorrhaging happening. They look really, really healthy now. They're putting on weight as well. We give them supplementary grain feed, but most of the day they're out here just eating grass. And as I said, it's a pretty simple setup. It's a hut with an open bottom. I put wire around. Actually, I need to improve this because um, in some places, like I had laid it out so it kind of extends a bit out in case they dig out, which hasn't happened so far. So I can cut this off again. Um, I put about four centimeters on wire on the inside so it's kind of like reaching in so they don't get too interested in the very edges of the hutch and um, the race is open bottom I put some shade cloth up over half of it in case it gets really windy and rainy so they can protect themselves from the elements a bit and then we have a simple metal roof on top so in the mornings we put them in um, I do move the hutch twice a day right now because they go through the grass really fast and we're kind of just moving them throughout the garden now trying to graze everything down maybe we even give them like a second round but ultimately like as soon as this resource that we have here is used up these two will end up in our freezer um, and that was the clear intention when we got that we didn't expect to keep them for very long so as cute as they are and it's going to be really hard for us um, these are an experiment in our <laughs> ever changing quest to grow enough protein on our land we do grow a lot of beans in the summer but um, right now we don't have the space to do um, as many beans as we kind of need to have a healthy diet so um, we trialing this out um, I think we're going to do it with chickens as well um, chickens are a bit more complicated because we do have a very active fox and marten population in this area that are constantly killing chickens left right and center and uh, we're currently working on chicken coop 3.0 um, that is gonna be more um, fox proof this time around but yeah i'm gonna move these guys now so you see how it's done As you can see this has been really grazed down and crushed by them. When we are done with these guys and they're in the freezer um, I'm definitely going to improve the hutch a bit. I'm going to attach like two little wheels in the back so it's a bit easier to move right now and we're going to permanently attach the metal sheet metal on top um, so it's not kind of like banging about in high winds it tends to fly off a bit um, but yeah it was a prototype that was uh, set up relatively quickly and uh, the shade cloth can definitely be improved a bit as well but overall really happy with um, how it's going they seem really happy I'm pretty sure they came from cages because when we put them in the first time they didn't really know um, what grass was I think now they have a better life and yeah overnight they're in the greenhouse it's a bit warmer in there and they're protected from the rain there as well and uh, yeah we've had them for a month now and we're probably good for another month with the grass that we have and then um, it's time for them <laughs> to go
Okay, welcome to winter in Portugal, which is often very cold, wet, and uh, slightly dark, but we do get really nice days sometimes um, with 20 degrees. And my favorite part about winter is the fruit that finally ripen here. Pretty much all year round, you find food here in Portugal that just grows on trees. And in this case, we got a huge box of kiwis from our friends who are not there to harvest their tree. This is a fraction of what's on that tree. And we're gonna turn it into jam because we it's impossible to eat this much kiwi. So today I'm gonna peel and chop all of this up and we're gonna freeze it. And probably this week we're gonna make some jam from it. Yeah, I'm doing this while I'm working. It's an ideal uh, little thing that you can do while you're waiting for a call. So two birds, two birds with one stone. I get some money basically for cutting up kiwis. There's so many abandoned fruit trees here. Like all of our quints comes from abandoned trees or like trees that just just no one harvest them. We also have a few kilos of oranges lying around right now that we're going to turn into orange marmalade, which I'm not a big fan of, but Zach is. I do understand with the oranges though, it's just such an ins like if you have like two or three orange trees, that's like four lifetimes of oranges for you. Um can't possibly juice and eat that much, I feel like. And uh, like our neighbor has a lemon tree, so I don't, I think we might plant some lemon trees here in the future, but we don't really need to because like our neighbor just like throws them at us. Um, we don't even need to ask for lemons um, because there's just so many of them. And citrus trees really, uh, really worth their money, I think. Um, you get more than you can eat. It's such an exciting season now because it's a slow season. Not everything, like we barely have anything in the garden. And uh, we also don't really use gas. Right now our stove is on pretty much half the day anyways. So the water that is needed for preserving and the heat that is needed for cooking jam gets produced anyway. So we better put something on to not waste the heat on just heating. No better time ready to make jam than now. And like, imagine being stuck in an office and missing out on this view, missing out on uh, cutting up kiwis uh, because you have to work. I feel very privileged that although I do have to work, I get to do it from the comfort of my own home. All right, it's the end of my shift. We still have a few kiwis left, but that's a bit more manageable now. And I got this whole bowl of uh, peeled fruit that I'm gonna pack into freezer bags now. And we're gonna freeze it. And probably this week when little toddlers at home, we're gonna make jam together. I'm going to use a recipe from my dad. Um, he used to make jam with our gooseberries and kiwis and banana. I don't have gooseberries. I don't know where I would get them. I tried to get them here, like as bushes, but just never found them. And uh, so it's going to be a kiwi and banana jam, which is like banana is not the first fruit you think of when you think of jam but it, it goes really well in it. It kind of takes all the acidity down a notch and it goes really well together with kiwi. So looking forward to that um, if the toddler doesn't eat all of the bananas in one go as he likes to do. If this is not a method I would generally recommend for freezing stuff, but these are only going to be in the freezer for a few days, so this laundry clip should work. The thing is, like, we own a gazillion of these, like, IKEA food clips, and I don't know where they are. <laughs> 
they're all like in use and you lose them. The food back clip is like the pen in the office. It's like the cheapest kitchen item you can get. And it's just, you never have one on hand pretty much. So yeah, these are gonna go in the freezer and in a few days we're gonna make jam. As good as defrosted. The fire is going over there. Um, the jars are already disinfected and sterilized. So this means we're gonna weigh out all of our fruit. Last night uh, I consulted with my dad about the ratios of um, kiwi to banana. So we're gonna go for a. Oh, do I need to work? I'm going to go for a ratio of one quarter banana to two, three quarters kiwi fruit. Um, so I've got bananas here. We always use 500 grams of sugar for one kilogram of fruit. So um, I think we have enough sugar. I hope we have enough sugar. 28, So in total, we have 6.9 kilograms of kiwi fruit. That That's a lot. <laughs> I don't think I ever cooked that much jam. In one go, I think we have to divide it into two batches, so um, that's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. Um, so I'm gonna weigh out the amount of banana per per pot, kind of. Oh, the math, the math is mathing. I think. Let's go. All right. As I've said in a previous video, we don't can, we don't pressure can, we don't own a pressure canner. First of all, it has no tradition here in Europe. Um, the traditional canning method is water bathing. Now, do I think pressure canning is safer? Sure. Can I afford to import a pressure canner from the US? No, it costs quite a lot of money. I would need to get like a whole new collection of jars. Just not worth it financially for me. We're not planning on canning any meat. Most of the food that we can is highly acidic, so the risk of botulism is quite low, and I will take that risk. Um, I do follow either family recipes or official VEC recipes from the producer of these jars. Now, this company, VEC, that we've chosen to go with now more and more over the years is such a household name in Germany. The name for preserving food is literally called Einwecken, um, as in it's kind of like using hoovering for like when you, when you vacuum clean. Anyways. So we've decided to really switch over to VEC. Um, I've owned jars for years. I've owned some jars that I got from my grandparents and I've gotten quite a few of them secondhand off eBay in Germany before we moved here um, because I was always into either fermenting or preserving for a long time. Basically the system works like this. You have a glass jar with a glass lid that goes on top. You have a, um, you have a rubber ring and the rubber ring goes over the rim. Now, this is not the right size. I don't have the right size rubber right now. Um, and then once the ring is in, you fixate everything with these clips, either these clips or these clips, and you water bath, and it creates this perfect seal, and the ring afterwards will point downwards when the seal is good. So why we chose this method, um, most of my life making jam with my dad, we use the screw top jars, the classic ones. Um, trying to be really conscious about our use of plastic, our use of plastics, especially plastic coatings, because um, we do want to limit our exposures to PFAS chemicals. Um, these are like forever chemicals that really affect your entire system as a human. We have them everywhere already but like there's no reason to continuously expose ourselves to them especially when you have screw top or the classic pressure canning jars um, that you get in the US the lids have a plastic coating that I guarantee you has PFAS chemicals in it and I just don't like the idea of heating this plastic coating up to really high temperatures and having the condensation water like kind of like drop back down into your food 
um not a big fan of that but obviously like we each do what we can these jars are quite pricey um we buy them in increments um this last shipment we got 20 jars and clips and rings and that cost us about 50 euros almost to get out here so this is um this is a pricier method but like i said i have some jars that i got from my grandparents and i still use them to this day the only thing you need to replace every once in a while is the rubber ring um and that is natural rubber and it basically doesn't touch your food we're really happy with this method and it works just perfectly fine for us so we have a few um 220 ml jars we have 250 ml jars and we have these half liter jars that um, we mostly use for tomato sauce and um, not so much for jam making and yeah, this is my rant about PFAS, I guess. <laughs> Basically, a few years ago, we watched this movie. Um, is it called Dark Waters or Black Waters? Not sure right now. It has Mark Ruffalo in it, and he's like this lawyer who fights DuPont for basically poisoning their workers with these PFAS chemicals that cause cancer and like really decimated his um, home community. Um, and after that, we like... We got rid of our Teflon pan. We've been cooking with either stainless steel or cast iron ever since. And I haven't looked back. Like, I really love cooking with cast iron now. And obviously, like, there's so many things in our everyday lives that have these forever chemicals in them. As you can find them in the uterus, in the placenta of a mother before the baby is even born. And um, I just don't <laughs> like that we created chemicals that affect our endocrine system to this degree. Um... Anyways, <laughs> end of my rant. So I brought this, after puring and adding the sugar, I brought it up to a rolling boil. I'm not sure how much this jam is going to set because I didn't add any pectin. And I forgot to research how much um, pectin is in kiwi. We'll see. Um, if not, it's not too bad. It's just a bit of a watery jam, but you know, good in yogurt. Um, my dad always used to use the... Well, in Germany, you can get like jam making sugar that already has pectin in it, but you can get that here at, at Aldi. But I recently discovered that it has palm oil in it as a, I think a stabilizer or something like that. And I don't want to have that orangutan in my jam. So we've just been going without pectin. Most of the jams that we've been making um, contain natural pectin. Um, so yeah, note to self, research kiwis next time. I should really wear an apron, actually. Yeah, today's the day for the rabbits. Um, I'm gonna be honest. I really, I really hate the moment before you kill like any animal. Uh, we've done chickens a few times now, but I feel like physically sick. I remember the first two times we killed chickens, I actually threw up because uh, it's just really hard. Um, I feel like really like a bit faint, honestly. My heart's going really fast. It's loads of adrenaline, I think. And it's not, it's not easy. 
this part like not at all i i hope it never gets easy i think that would be wrong this should be really really hard <sighs> yeah needs to be done i need to get to work so don't have a lot of time Neck incisions by pulling the skin away from the groin area and inserting one or two fingers, creating enough room for you to insert your knife. In okay, yeah, yeah, we don't want to cut that. <laughs> the area is released from the legs. Stop when you reach the tail, so you kind of just want to go around now. Until the pictures? There's not really a picture, it's just kind of like oh, okay. you, you pull down now from here until you reach the tail. Okay. So you kind of want to grab this piece, I think, as far as I understand. I Oh my god. Why is it so skinny though? <laughs> I'll change my gloves after this. Maybe. It's actually not skinnier than his rabbit. Alright. Wow. Yeah, be mindful of that. Oh my god. Bit of splash on my arms, but it's not so bad. Look okay. at that. Little sleeves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like it has like tiny little fur boots. Mm -hmm. And it's so oh man. does come off quite easily. Alright, so please don't use the knife. Okay, Just yeah, use sure. the knife to cut open. Oh, the whole thing can be done by tearing. <laughs> yeah, so fingers around and then just pull it away. And I just tore the just tore it away at the top. Yeah. Oh it's so warm. Yeah. It's a bit uncomfortable. It'll cool down. I know. He cuts like I cut once up through here and then I kind of cut the tail off as well. But I pulled the I it's set in the book. Yep. Maybe come to the front a little bit as well, yeah. Make sure you get it peeling on all sides. There you go, exactly. Uh, it's just meat now. I know. Yeah. Oh, uh, what's that? Triangle the knife like this. Like, yeah. Okay, you have the lungs. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, do I just kind of like help them out? What does the book say? I uh, didn't get that they, They'll come out. Yeah, it's like kind of get them to dangle out. Okay, I'm going to go and wash oh. mine off now. Like, you've, you've, we're at almost the same stage now. Yeah, I think um, I need to go to work, actually, to be honest. Yeah, then I can I can finish off. But if you can just, once you've got all the inside out, please remove all the organs and yeah. guts, and then just wash it off, and then I'll cut the feet off and put them in the chill, and I'll get them ready and take them over to yeah. the fridge. Oh wow, the lungs are so pink. Mm -hmm. Incredible. Where's Flocky Ball here? So it's been two days since we slaughtered the rabbits and they've been dry aging in the neighbor's fridge since then. Now it's time to go get them and uh, cut them up. When, they're, when they've been uh, cut into the primal, we're going to use these vacuum seal bags to seal most of it and then put it in the freezer. But today we'll make a stew with the four legs and the sides, which are apparently pretty good for stewing. Um, looking back on the experience of uh, killing the rabbits, it was easier than we thought it would be. There was, we were both quite anxious, as always, before taking the life of an animal. The method that we used is called the broomstick method, which killed them instantly and there was no pain and they were very comfortable in those last moments. That was important to us, as it is to most people. Processing the rabbits after the killing was definitely easier than it is with chickens, because there's no plucking involved. Skinning the hides was very straightforward, very fast, and yeah, didn't involve any scalding or yeah, tedious plucking. So it was, uh, I think we'll, we'll definitely raise more rabbits in the future. They were pretty useful for keeping the grass in the garden under control. Uh, but yeah, generally we'll, we'll probably usually always have a few rabbits and some chickens on hand to process for meat as well. Yeah, also it's, uh, it's easier to make more use of the animal than it is with chickens as well. Like uh, except for the head, every single part of the body will be used and the feet as well. They, the head and the feet got discarded and uh, the guts as well. We gave the offal to our dog 
and the, the hides we've got preserving the hides as well we'll probably make another video about that so at the end of the day almost all of the the animal is being used now so that also makes us feel a bit better <laughs> so this is our butchering setup uh, it's very simple especially with the rabbit essentially you only need one one sharp knife to do the job uh, a cutting board this one has uh, these ridges along the edge for drainage and a clean working area a bowl to put the cuts in when they've been done and this is our first time ever butchering a rabbit so we've got this this book here uh, which we we'll use for reference there's a lot of blood in this and it's a bit cl clotted so i'm just going to remove some of the clotted material it, we didn't uh, bleed these rabbits we just uh, killed them instantly so the heart wasn't beating so there's still quite a lot of blood left in the in the meat in the book it says you can remove the clotted blood so now i'm going to cut the flank away which is this uh, piece of meat right here it go it connects to the the rear leg muscles runs along the loin which i believe is this muscle and then comes along the rib the, the ribs so first i'll cut here and then fillet the remaining part off the rib so get the knife right in along the hind leg and make that separating cut cut along the loin muscle which is the back until it reaches the ribs which is just there as the first rib now the next step is to fillet so it's a bit more tricky but you can see here the this is the muscle of the flank where it connects to the rib so I should be able to slice in using the fingers to pull pull the meat back as I slice it it was a pretty small rabbit so there's not much meat here I'm not making a very good success of it they were sold to us as meat rabbits but I don't think it's one of the breeds that puts on like like the overbred breeds I think it's probably just like an older Portuguese breed so that is the flank there really wasn't much meat over the ribs um, I got off what I could the main part of the meat was between the rib and the hind leg so the rib started here and the hind leg here and it's not bad yeah this is a uh, full of uh, connective tissue apparently makes great stew as Zach said, we're stewing the rabbit today, so I'm gonna, I guess it's called braising, um, where you kind of brown the meat on all sides. Um, my inspiration is Samwise Gamgee, in Ithelian. You need a little bit of meat and a few roots to make a good meal, and that's what we're going for today. I have loads of herbs from the garden, have some carrots from the garden, and uh, I'm gonna make a nice little meal out of this. Listen to that sizzle. I'm going to use the axe for the next bit. <laughs> this is a dual purpose hatchet. Usually I just use it to limb uh, branches and stuff, but it was also made for, for butchering, like out in the wild. Uh, this isn't in the wild, but it's, uh, it's going to be a stand-in for a cleaver now, because we don't own a cleaver. Well, since we own this, we do. I'll just cut this off right there. Mm -hmm. Right. In yeah, the perfect. Um, the total amount of meat that we got out of this now is 2,099 grams, which I took some averages. I took the average of uh, dis disassembled, dismembered, butchered rabbit pieces that you can get in the shop here that are just conventionally farmed rabbit and that was about 10 euros a kilo in different shops um, obviously this is not a conventionally farmed rabbit it's grass grass fed and except for the feed that we bought um, like we bought some grain feed that wasn't organic but it, this rabbit is as organic as it gets here um, so yeah we made about 20 euros of meat which is good because we spent 20 euros on the rabbits. Um, next time we would do that differently. Um, 
we wanted to get younger rabbits because they're, they're cheaper as well. But at our local um, agricultural shop, they didn't have younger rabbits. They only had these older rabbits, which was fine. Um, and we had about one and a half months of secure feed um, in the garden for them. So they actually didn't get too old for butchering that we would need to stew the entire thing. So the total investment that we had here was 20 euros for the rabbits and five euros for the feed that we bought for them. Um, all the equipment already existed, though if we had to buy that new, um, it would be about 150 euros. So you can see that the scale is quite big here. You would need to kind of produce a lot of rabbit meat to make the investments worth it. You can have a more basic setup for sure. Um, we were just quite concerned about safety since we had our old rabbits die on us from um, a hemorrhaging disease. So we really wanted to have an overnight cage that was raised up off the ground so they're not in contact um, with anything. And that was quite important to us. So yeah, um, we're definitely gonna do this again um, next time with younger rabbits. You can get young, like I think one month old rabbits here for about four euros, five euros a rabbit. Oh yeah. Oh. The stew. So right now the stew is slow cooking and because we're not on a mission to destroy the one ring and we do have access to supermarkets, we did add potatoes. But I added laurel leaves, um, sage and thyme from our garden, some of our own carrots, some of our own onions. So except for the potatoes, this entire meal is farm raised, which is pretty cool. We'll have potatoes this year, isn't it? Huh? This and we'll have potatoes year. this year as well. So in autumn, if we have another pair of rabbits, it's going to be 100% raised on our land the entire meal, which is pretty cool. So yeah, this is going to slow cook for quite a while now while I work. And in the afternoon, we're going to give it a taste test. Must it turn off? Yeah. This tastes really good. Yeah. Different, tastes different to chicken. Uh... Broth, definitely. Can, you can see the Jacke yeah. einfach aus. Tastes different to chicken broth. Mm. Mm. I haven't had any of the meat yet. The meat is really tender. Pizza ready. Is then the pizza fertig? Mm. Yeah. Wow. Good? Mm. Yeah. And the tender, it's like if you stew a chicken all day, it's going to be just as tender as this, but the taste is different. Yeah. I think I'll add a little pizza bit more ready. salt, but this is, mm. this is amazing. Pizza ready. <laughs> Pizza ready? Yeah. Yeah. Pizza? Yeah. yeah, it's good. It's good. Success. <laughs>